Well, here he is again, folks. Dizzy Dean, brought to you by the makers of Johnson's Wax for Car New, the wax-fortified auto polish that cleans and polishes your car in one easy application. Howdy, folks. Frank, if it's all right with you, I got a short one about a great pitcher today, Ewell Blackwell of the Reds. Well, that's fine, Jerome. Folks, this is Frank Eschen, happy to give Dizzy Dean the cue to go quickly today into the anecdote department. So let's have that Ewell Blackwell story, Diz. I guess Blackwell is one of the toughest pitchers in the business when he's right, Frank. He really throws with a buggy whip motion. It looks like he's just handing the ball to the catcher. He powders him in so fast. Well, he was pitching against the Giants, and he was giving that New York team fits. Blackwell has one of the finest crossbar delivers i ever seen in any league, and he really had it working that day. You know how the crossbar works, Frank. You step off of the third base side of the rubber, and you stride toward the plate with a kind of a give on the third base side. That makes the ball go past you so funny at the plate it seems like it's going to land in the first base dugout. <laughs> well, Blackwell really had it working, and Jack Larkey, the Giants' third baseman, was having all kinds of trouble. On the first pitch, Larkey fell down the dirt, thinking the ball was going to hit him. But umpire Barr says, strike one. Larkey was a little dazed, but he didn't say nothing. He just got up there again, and once more, Blackwell comes in with that same crossbar fast one, and down goes Larkey again. And this time, Barr calls it again. Strike two. Larkey gets up and dusts himself off and kind of turns to the umpire Barr and says, uh, George, was well, them two pitches over the plate? And Barr says, yes, Jack, they were perfect strikes. They got at least six inches of that outside corner. That wasn't even close to being balls. And Larky's still dusting himself off so nobody would think he was squawking to the umpire, says, George, will you tell me one thing? And Barr, says, who is one of the most politest umpires in the business, says, yes, Jack, what is it you wish to know? And Larky says, I wish you'd tell me, George, who's throwing them, Blackwell or the third baseman? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Jerome, I believe you got at least six inches of the plate with that one. By the way, did you ever throw a crossfire when you were pitching? No, Frank, I never needed a crossbar when I had my high hard one. And when I lost that one, it was too late. Well, when do you know that high hard one isn't there anymore, Dizzy? The batters will tell you that, Frank. But you hate to admit it. I remember a game after I was with the Cubs. We was playing in the polo grounds, and one of them New York power hitters connects in the ninth inning with a couple of men on base. He hits one of my fastballs a country mile into the right field stands, breaking up the ball game. We have to catch an early train that evening, and I'm still thinking about it as we pull out of Penn Station. And a fresh rookie pitcher sits down next to me in the Pullman uh, and starts a conversation. He says, uh, Dizzy, uh, whatever become of your fastball? <laughs> did you keep your temper in that trying moment, Jerome? <laughs> yes, I did, Frank. I started to get hot, but I answered him uh, real polite. I says, uh, Sonny... You'll probably find it still bouncing around them upper right field seats at the polo grounds. <laughs> a very kindly way of handling a trying situation, Jerome. I'm proud of you. Now we come to the mailbag. Mrs. Dorothy O'Connor of Brooklyn wants you to pick an all-star major league team from the players you've seen in your career as a pitcher and as an observer from the radio booth. Boy, that's a large order. But I'll give it a try, Frank. Only I want some help from you and I want a little time. I have seen a lot of mighty fine ball players. Uh, let's pick that all-star team next Saturday. Well, I'm glad you're cautious, Jerome. I think it's a good idea to give that team some thought. And now from the mailbag, Mr. J. Donald Seidel of West Lawn, Pennsylvania, wants you to tell about an incident in the Bellevue Stratford Hotel in Philadelphia when you and a couple of your cardinal friends broke up the dignified quiet of that state old hostelry with your antics. He remembers it had something to do with some sort of disguise the boys wore. Yes, I remember, Frank. Mr. Seidel must mean the time me and Pepper Martin and Heinrich Schublin had some fun. It was an off day in Philly, and while we was winter shopping, Pepper sees some overalls and striped caps to match. He says he has an idea, and before we know it, we each got overalls and one of them caps. <laughs> when we get back to the hotel, we change into the overalls and caps. Pepper bars a hammer and a yardstick and says, follow me. I think we'll have some fun. We went into a, to the dining room where some kind of meeting was being held. I think it was about uh, child welfare. A lot of uh, dignified old gentlemen was having dinner and making speeches. Well, Pepper had him move a couple of tables. He measured a space on the wall and says, that picture's got to come down. Then he starts hammering on the stove when the Chinese cook liked to have a fit. 
back into the dining room, and we gets into an argument about uh, what should be moved and what shouldn't during the uh, move, uh, during the argument. Uh, Pepper holds up his hand near his big snozzle, and that's my cue. I haul off and hit his hand with the palm of my hand, and it looks like I scored a clean knockout. The youth welfare speaker quit his speech making, and and them that was eating their desserts all jumped to their feet to see the fight among us partners. <laughs> That's a rather rough way of playing, Jerome, breaking up a youth welfare meeting like that. Well, it wasn't so bad, Frank. About that time, somebody recognizes Pepper and says, uh, them is cardinal ball players. And do you know what? They took us up to the head table, and instead, we tell them about the ball club and baseball. And so it all ended happily, eh? Yes, we was all happy, Frank, until we uh, spied a gentleman sitting over at the end of the head table. A gentleman we didn't know was there. And who was he, Jerome? Uh, Branks Ricky, Frank. <laughs> Nobody else. <laughs> what did he say? Just two words, Frank. He says, uh, I'm mortified. And when Mr. Ricky is mortified... You said it, Frank. Them cute little caps and them overalls went into the trunks and they didn't come out no more. You know, it's a wise man that knows... Uh, modified Mr. Ricky too much. And things were quiet on the old gas house gang for a while. Yes, I says to Pepper, uh, Johnny, it looks like we can't have no fun no more. You and me might just as well go fishing up to Nova's Copus. But you uh, still had your baseball and what you call your high hard one. And speaking of those youth welfare movements, Jerome, I suppose you frequently were called on to contribute your time and efforts in such programs. Yes, and you're always uh, glad to have, uh, after you did what you could, Frank, uh, while we was getting Mr. Ricky unmodified after that little Philadelphia incident, he told us he wanted us to visit a certain children's hospital as soon as we get back to St. Louis. And, of course, we said we would. Ah, that meant a lot to those kids, Diz. Yes, and uh, they asked you to do some pretty difficult things. Uh, like that day at the hospital in St. Louis, me and Pepper asked the kids if there was any little thing we could do for them. We figured maybe they'd uh, wanted love or a ball. But one little fella asked me if I'd really do something for him. All he wanted me to do was strike out Bill Terry that afternoon with the bases loaded. <laughs> a rather large order and dangerous, too. You said it. Why couldn't he have said uh, Johnny Burgess or Huey Kreitz? Well, how did it come out, Diz? Well, we got into the ninth inning, a run ahead, and uh, then with two outs, somebody gets a pop single and a pop double, and there's men on second and third. Uh, that brings up Huey Kreitz. I walks him on four pitches, and there's a commotion in the dugout. Frisch wants to know what's the big idea with Bill Terry coming up. But I explained to Frank after Quits has walked uh, that I promised them kids at the hospital I'd fan Terry with a bases fill. I get two strikes over the corner real quick, and then I walk in and tell Terry what I'm going to do. I said, Bill, I promised a kid at the hospital this morning I'd strike you out with the bases loaded. That's what I walked little Huey for. Bill, I, Bill, I says, uh, this one's going to be a fast one right through the middle. Bill, of course, didn't uh, think I, uh, don't think I'm crazy enough to do a thing like that. So what does he do? He takes that fast one right down the middle for a strike three call. <laughs> Dizzy Dean, that sure is a new approach to the pitching problem. It makes striking a man out just about as easy as, well, as easy as cleaning your car with car new. And seriously, these days it is getting a lot easier to give your car a clean, polished, sparkling look. One reason is those new streamlined bodies that have become so popular. Those new cars don't have the corners and crevices the old ones had. And the other reason cars are getting easier to clean is car new, the wax-fortified auto polish. You see, Johnson's car new cleans and polishes your car, and it does it in one easy application. One application, and the chrome, the finish, the whole body of your car sparkles like a million. All you do is rub some car new on, let it dry to a white powder, and then wipe it off, and the job is done. And here's why it's so easy. There are five separate cleaning ingredients in Johnson's car new, and they cut right through the film of bugs, tree sap, oil, and tar that cling to the finish of your car, a film that water won't touch. But car new is more than a cleaner. It's a wax-fortified polish, too, that leaves your car with a really brilliant luster. Now, when this program is over, why not stop in at your service station or other Johnson dealer and get some Johnson's wax-fortified car new? Use it today, and tomorrow, ease down the driveway in a car with a real Sunday shine. Okay, Jerome, now it's time for Coach Dizzy Dean. And what advice have you today for baseball-minded young America? 
I hope this will help the boys improve their game, Frank. Last week, I suggested that boys do all they could to find some old-time ball player to coach them, to learn them how to play the game right. Well, I realize they all can't do that right away. So here's a suggestion. Go to as many professional ball games as possible. If you live near a big league city, so much the better. But the minor league clubs have good smart managers, too. And when you watch a ball game, pick out the man who plays your own favorite position. If you're a first baseman, watch the first baseman on both clubs. See where they play with nobody on base. See how they shift when a runner is on first. Notice how they shift after their runners on first and second. So the man on first ain't likely to steal. Notice how they shift to take throws. If you're a second baseman or a shortstop, watch your players taking throws. If you're a pitcher, watch how the pitchers stand, how they throw to the bat bases. Boys, if you'll just keep your eyes open. You can learn a lot from good ball players by watching them do things. Then go out and practice doing it the big league way. Well, that's sound advice for youngsters and for all of us, Jerome. And now in a less serious vein, how about an anecdote or two, huh? All right, Frank. Uh, how about a story about that great catcher, Jimmy Wilson? Mm, that sounds good, Jerome. Proceed. This one about Jimmy Wilson shows how smart he was at making other people smart. You know, I thought pretty well of my fastball, Frank, when I could throw it. I didn't like to have anybody suggest that any batter in the whole world could hit my fastball. But every time we'd play Brooklyn, Jimmy Wilson would warn me up about, warn me about these hitters, and uh, one day he says, Dizzy, don't throw that Cuccinelli a fastball. He'll murder it. I kept arguing that Cuccinelli couldn't hit my fastball. Then one day we got about a ten-run lead on the Dodgers in their own ballpark, and when Cuccinelli come to the plate in in about the seventh inning, Jimmy Wilson walks out to the mound. He says, Diz, you think Cuccinelli can't hit your fastball? Let's try. Just throw that hard one in there and see what happens. Well, I go one pass, Tony. But the next one, in, he hit for um, four miles over the left field seats. Boy, I'll bet it's still going. Well, what did Wilson say to that, Diz? He didn't say nothing, Frank. I walks uh, in to get a new ball from Bill Clem, the umpire, and I says to Wilson, Jimmy, I reckon you're right. Uh, that ball uh, Cuccinelli hit was no change of pace. <laughs> well, now, Diz, it's time for your baseball fans to be catching what you have to say about the big league picture. So start pitching Dizzy Dean, the reporter. Frank, have you a real good friend in the hotel business in Boston? Well, yes, I think I know Mr. Boniface or two, Jerome, but why do you ask? Call right or war right away, Frank. See if you can get a reservation for about seven days starting the 5th or 6th of October. That's World Series time. It looks right now as if we'll see the whole show in Boston this year. An all-Boston World Series, eh, Mr. Dean? Yes, it looks more and more that way, Frank. The Yankees are two and a half games behind the Red Sox, and they missed their big chance in the series that closed yesterday. I believe the Red Sox are about in. The Braves are in pretty good position, too. They haven't got the advantage in the loss column that the Red Sox got, but they'll be playing at home, and they're five games ahead of Pittsburgh on the win side. That's money in the bank for Billy Southworth. Them games already has been won. Well, uh, who's going to give the Braves the hotter challenge, according to your crystal ball, Jerome? Well, Frank, the Pirates are only one game behind in the uh, loss column, and I like that Pittsburgh club. Some people are calling the Pirates a team of discards, but I can't see that. Bill Meyer, who is doing a fine job of managing, has a good outfield, a fast infield, and two fine catchers. The next Eastern trip will tell the story for Pittsburgh. And it's harder to win on the road than at home. Yes, that's certainly right, Diz. Now there's one other club I'd like to ask you about. How about Brooklyn? The Dodgers will be at home entertaining the Western clubs, Frank. They're tough in their own ballpark. But I still like the chances of the Red Sox and the Braves. Uh, Better get in touch with that uh, Boston hotel man, Frank. That I will, Diz. I'll get a wire off to Boston right away. And folks, we hope you'll be right back with us at the same time next week to listen to Dizzy Dean. He's brought to you by Johnson's Car New, the wax-fortified auto polish that cleans and polishes your car in one easy application. Car New cleans when you rub it on, penetrates the sticky road film that water won't touch. Johnson's Car New polishes when you wipe it off, gives your car a bright, sparkling luster from tail light to front bumper. Car New is easy to get. Your service station owner and other dealers have it. It's easy to use because, remember, to give your car that Sunday shine, rub it on, wipe it off, is all you do with Johnson's Car New. 
And this is old Diz. Hope all you folks are in the stands this time next Saturday. I'll be pitching them across again for Johnson's Car News. This is Frank Eshen saying goodbye until next Saturday for the makers of Johnson's Wax Fortified Auto Polish Car New. This program came to you from KSD St. Louis. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Oh.